Dear loving God, we thank you for uh, another opportunity for us to look closely at your word. We pray for the power of your Holy Spirit to surround us and, and give us an ability to concentrate, to receive from scripture, to, to learn the things that will be helpful to each of us uh, in our relationship with you and also in our development as Christian ministers. And so we commit this time into your loving hands and pray these, all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so today, tonight we're going to look at just two books of the New Testament. We're looking at Ephesians and Colossians. We classified Ephesians and Colossians as what? Deutero-Pauline. Do you remember that? And Deutero means, means secondarily Pauline. And the reason for that is that scholars debate whether or not Paul actually wrote these letters. And so today, I, I don't have an exact number, but probably half the scholars think that Paul did write these letters, and half of the scholars think that somebody wrote these letters in Paul's name. Someone who had lived with Paul, studied from Paul, learned from Paul. Uh, so we have no way of knowing for sure. But what we can do is we can, as scholars, we can examine the language, the vocabulary, and the ideas. In this class, uh, this, since this is not an introduction to New Testament, we're going to focus mostly on the theology. We're not going to concern ourselves too much with who the author is. I'm going to simply say to you that from my own analysis, I am confident that either Paul did write these two letters, or it was somebody who wrote, they call this person an amanuensis, someone who wrote, uh, Paul talked about his ideas and they wrote down his ideas. Or it could even be somebody who wrote later on, who wanted to summarize his ideas, but use some different language. I don't know for sure, because what we see in Ephesians is that there are some very, very long sentences that are not in the undisputed letters. We also see that there are some, some ideas and some language that, that we don't find in the other letters. At the same time, we find that there are many points of comparison between the, the non-disputed letters in Ephesians. When we get to Colossians, we're going to see that Paul has a very developed, the author of Colossians, I should say, has a very developed idea about who Jesus is. His Christology is far more developed than we see in the non-disputed seven letters. But again, there's no contradiction there's just more development, uh, more thought, and uh, I think it's safe for us to call these Pauline letters. I think it's a safe thing to do. And so, again, if we use Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 as a way to summarize Paul's thought, uh, we are correct to do so. Because it is, what's expressed in those verses expresses very well what we find in Galatians and Romans. Okay, so I'm not going to talk a lot about the differences, but I, am, I do want you to realize there are some developments in Ephesians and Colossians from what we find in the other seven letters. All right, with that said, uh, let me show you a few pictures. Uh, well, first of all, I'll show you the map again to remind you of the three major missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. And you can see up there, as I said last time, that on Paul's second missionary journey, he was uh, kept from going into Bithynia up in the north. And he felt, what he said is that the Holy Spirit, he said Acts, the Holy Spirit kept us from, or forbid us from going up into the north. We don't have any more details than that. And so instead they went to Troas, which is right here, 
And during the night, Paul got a vision. A vision to cross over. And as I told you last time, he then crossed over the Aegean Sea and went into Philippi. And that's we studied Philippians last time. And he studied, and he uh, founded the church in Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. And then he went down to Athens and over to Corinth. And then after this, all of this work was done in ancient Greece, what we call Greece today, he, he sailed to Ephesus. And in Ephesus he began a ministry that he would come back to. But he spent a great deal of time in Ephesus, uh, maybe three years at a time, establishing the church, developing the church. So Ephesus became a very important center for, Paul the, uh, for Paul's mission uh, and Paul's relationship and the development of Paul's thinking. Uh, and so then after that he went to Judea. Here is Colossae. In some, some translations you'll find it Coloss, C-O-L-O-S-S-E. Uh, this spelling is pronounced Colossae. But e either one refers to this city that Paul writes to in his letter to the Colossians. So these are the two cities that we have in mind today. So that's just a little bit about geography and history as a backdrop. And then I want to also show you a few photos from modern day Ephesus. I don't have any photos from modern day uh, Coloss, but I do have a number of photos from from Ephesus because a lot of excava excavation work has been done there. Ephesus was a major city uh, in the first century. And this is what we have is the ruins of the a big amphitheater where Paul was, was taken, where Paul wanted to speak to the whole crowd. Uh, do you remember the story of his time in Ephesus? We find it in, again, you have to read the book of Acts. But he was, he was arrested, he was challenged because he was accused of blaspheming the great goddess Artemis in Ephesus. And they wanted to, to they basically wanted to, to kill him. And so there was this huge gathering in, up and all, people were gathered at all of those places, all those seats there. And in this Colosseum type, type of, uh, of place, the, they were talking about what they were going to do with this blasphemer. And I, I won't go into the whole story there, but I'm just showing you this place where there was a great deal of drama and a great deal of danger for the Apostle Paul. Here we see some statues, uh, carvings that are still exist. Uh, here, this is Artemis, the great goddess. Uh, the, the goddess who, who was in the central place of the worship of the people in Ephesus. It was really an amazing place of, uh, and it's amazing that we have so much of it still intact 2,000 years ago, ago uh, from 2,000 years ago. Of course, a lot of it has been restored. So here's another look at that huge area. Uh, again, it's, it's a Colosseum type of place uh, or theater type of place uh, where the people would have gathered you know, demanding uh, the, the execution of Paul. Fortunately, his friends talked him out of speaking in front of those people. Uh, and so, and, and uh, a man stood up and was able to convince the people to stop their, their what he called rioting, riotous behavior. And so the situation was, uh, was, was pacified. Okay, so that is Ephesus. All right, so now let's go to the letter of Ephesians. Now I'm in your notes, and I'm reading where it says the overview. Ephesians is similar to Romans in a number of ways. It's a rich theological treatise summarizing key doctrines and presenting practical implications for daily Christian living. If not written by Paul, then Ephesians was written by those who learned from Paul. 
So now let's look at some uh, of the particular aspects of the letter. Number one, there is a spiritual reality in the heavenlies, quote unquote. That, that term, heavenlies, or in heaven, is found nowhere else in Paul's writings. And perhaps it's what we could call a Neoplatonic concept. Uh, have you studied Plato? Okay, ancient Greek philosopher. How many have, have heard of Plato or studied Plato? Raise your hand. Okay, several of you. Okay, Plato, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle were three of the most famous ancient Greek philosophers. And there was a concept that, that Plato had that the real, what's real in all of the universe is in, in what we could call heaven. And what we see in this world is like a shadow of reality. In other words, that another term he would use is the forms. The, the, the original forms of everything are in heaven. And so some scholars wonder if when Paul, when Paul talks about our salvation being in the heavenlies, even though we're here, but he talks about our being in the heavens. How could we be here and there? How could we be here and our salvation be there? Well, maybe it's an, this idea, a Neoplatonic idea, that the reality is up there somewhere. But you and I are here experiencing a, a reflection of, of what's real. Well, that's just a backdrop for the ideas. We can't go into much more detail than that. What's important for us is to try to understand Paul's theology as it's expressed in Ephesians. Uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to read verses 1 through 14. And this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, put it up here in the text. Can you read this font size in the back row? Okay, is it big enough? All right, if you have your Bible, uh, which, I, which you should have, please open your Bible to Ephesians chapter one. But I'm also putting it on the screen so that when I read it, you can either follow in your Bible or you can, you can see what I'm reading here. All right, and what I want you to be looking for is what, did, what is Paul's theology according to these first 14 verses? What is Paul's theology? In other words, what does he believe about God? What does he believe about Christ? What does he believe about the Spirit? What does he believe about us, the church? Now, 14 verses don't necessarily, don't expect everything to be covered, but here it's amazing how much theology he expresses in these 14 verses. So these are very rich verses for us. Verses 3 through 14 in the original Greek is one, are one long sentence. This is the longest sentence, maybe, maybe the longest sentence in the New Testament, I'm not sure. But this is, Paul has woven together this interconnected series of theological thoughts. So, what I want you to do is to look at these verses and, and then tell me, tell us, what is his theology according to these verses? So in other words, just, just give me one point, then we'll give another point, then another. So what's up here right now is verses three through nine. All right, what do you see there? He chose us in him before the creation of the world. And so he, he chose us in him, Christ, before the creation of the world. Okay? All right? What else? Thank you. What else? What else strikes you here is really significant. Okay. He, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. What, what does predestined mean? Predestined. So, to, have you heard the English word destiny? Like, what is your destiny? Like, where will you go one day? Where will you end up? Well, if, if you, and pre means before. 
So if you predestined someone, that means God determined your destiny. He, pre he did it beforehand. Before you were born, He decided your destiny. And your destiny, according to these verses, is that you would be, what? Adopted as His sons and daughters. All right, so we can add daughters here because it's, he means both sons and daughters. It's an inclusive term in the, in, the, in the original context. So in other words, God, back to verse 4, God chose you. And what does that mean? That means he predestined you. He did it before the creation of the world. And the destiny is that you would be adopted as his sons and daughters. And how would that come about? Through Jesus Christ. Alright? So we're getting God the Father as, as one who determines... This is soteriology, okay? Do you, do you hear that? He doesn't use the word salvation, but if He chooses you to be His sons and daughters, that's soteriology. And, but it's through Jesus Christ. So you see, again, Christ is at the center of Paul's theology and soteriology. Okay, excellent. What else do you see here? Why did he do it according to verse 5? Why did he choose to adopt you as sons and daughters? In accordance with? Yeah, he just wanted to. Okay? It, brought in, it brings God pleasure for you to be his son or daughter. Okay? That's theology. Because he, Paul is telling you something about the Creator God. When I go outside and I look at the stars, I know that God's ability, or I look at creation, I think God's ability is amazing. All right? So, or if you study even, say, process theology, have you heard of that? Where God is a force at work in, in everything. You know God's powerful. God's connected. But what Paul's theology does is he goes beyond power to say that God is personal. And God takes pleasure in having a relationship with you. In fact, he takes so much pleasure in it that he makes it happen. He predestined you to be adopted as his sons and daughters because he wanted to and because it gives him pleasure. Excellent. Verse 6. To what end? So he has a relationship, brings him pleasure. But what will it result in? So ultimately, the Creator God is going to be praised by whom? Probably his creation, okay? All right, his creation will praise him when his creation sees his marvelous plan. And so God's plan to create you, to adopt you, cho choosing you, to bring you into relationship, all results in you praising God for his work in your life. And it's the praise of his glorious grace not just of him as a, as a being. It's grace that is in his character, but that it's something he gives to you, freely given through the one he loves. Okay, by which he means Jesus Christ here. Verse 7, what do we have? I'll, put, I'll push this up for us. Verse 7, in Christ, what do we have? Redemption. Okay, redemption is another way of talking about forgiveness. Uh, we've been redeemed. And how does this redemption come about? Through His blood. Alright, so, so again, this is so important for your soteriology to recognize that blood is important. Now some of you, maybe all of you already knew that as traditional Baptists. But many modern day theologies want to distance themselves from the blood of Jesus. You know, John Hick, for example. You know John Hick? Okay, John Hick is very famous, was very famous. And he wanted to say that, that, you know, God can forgive without a sacrifice. Well, yes, he can. 
Jesus could forgive the, uh, the paralytic and forgive him of his sins and allow him to stand up and walk. God has the ability to be merciful to anyone for any reason that God wants to forgive. But the heart of biblical teaching, the heart of New Testament theology and Old Testament theology is that God has chosen a means of forgiveness that involves blood, the sacrifice of blood. And so we as theologians are not free, in my opinion, to, to distance ourselves from the blood of Jesus Christ in our soteriology. We can acknowledge that God is able to forgive anyone he wants to, for any reason he wants to. But the teaching of the New Testament is that somehow, in a way that we may or may not understand, God brings about our redemption through blood. So your theology needs to understand as best as you can what that role of blood is. He doesn't explain it here. But, he, but he, he, he mentions it. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, as we just said, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. All right. So in accordance means it matches up. So what God does for you by forgiving you fits with the nature of who God is. See, more, th more theology. See, soteriology is connected to theology. Your salvation and mine is a reflection of a God who loves us and who is so gracious that he wants to forgive you. He wants to provide a way for you to be in relationship with him. Okay, what does verse 10 say? I think we are, I'm, oh, did I skip, I'm sorry, I did seven. Verse 8, the grace he lavished on us, that means he poured it out on us. All right? He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding, and he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, again, which he purposed in Christ. What does mystery mean in the New Testament? Do you know that term? It has a technical meaning. A mystery, how many of you have ever seen a mystery movie on television? You know what that is? Only a few of you? A mystery movie is when something happens and you don't know what it is. You watch the movie, who, who killed that person? Who, who stole those jewels? You watch and you watch and you watch. At the end of the movie, ah, you were the one, or she was the one, right? And the mystery is solved. Okay, so mystery is something you don't know. But in the New Testament, the idea of mystery means it's something you didn't know before, but now you do know. And so in the New Testament, the idea of mystery, the mystery of God, the mystery of salvation through Christ, is that, is what that concept means, is that in the Old Testament, the redemption of the world, the redemption of, of humankind was foretold in various ways in the Old Testament. But it was a mystery as to how was that really going to be, how, how was it going to come about? Finally, the mystery was revealed in Jesus Christ. And so when, when Paul talks about mystery, he's saying, now you know what we didn't know before. Jesus Christ is God's chosen means to provide salvation for the world. And, uh, and so this mystery of his will, verse 10, is to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. All right, according to this verse, Jesus Christ is supposed to be the head the fulfillment of all of God's plans. And how many people do you think that includes of the world, according to this verse? Just the people in the West, perhaps? Americans. Is this verse for the Americans? How about the Europeans? Africans? Asians? 
Who, who, how, how, how many people are included? All people in heaven and earth. Under one head, Jesus Christ. So, at the very, very least, Paul is an inclusivist. At the least. Alright? And what I mean by that is the whole world is, is under Christ. Paul could never be a pluralist. All right? Pluralism, as far as I, I can see, is, is excluded. Because pluralism says there are, are different ways to heaven. Our way, Christian way, is under Christ. Your way, if you're Buddhist, is under Buddha. Or by Buddha. Somebody else is one of the Hindu gods. Or they may say there's one God over all of them. All right? But that's not Paul's theology. That, that's somebody else's theology. That's somebody else's idea. It's a modern idea. Paul's idea is that the head over all is Jesus Christ. And so that's why I say, if you, are, if you came into this class as an exclusivist, and you want to broaden, for Paul, if you, if you want to base it on Paul's teaching, the farthest you can go is inclusivism. Okay, but you can't, in my opinion, you can't go farther. But what does he mean, all things are under Christ? Well, he doesn't explain yet. So we have to keep looking for that answer. Alright? And then now we're in verse 11. In him we were also chosen. It's the same idea again. Having been predestined, same idea, according to the plan of him, God, who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Okay, there's a, a technical term we use in theology known as the sovereignty of God. Do you know that word? Did you study that in systematic theology? Sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. It's like a, a ruler. He rules over everything. So if God is sovereign, that means nothing happens outside of God's will. All right? And that's what he's saying. He's saying here in verse 11 that what God has done is that he's chosen you to be his children. And, but that fits with his plan for the entire universe. Somehow, that fits with his plan for the universe. And he always is at work making his plan, that means his idea, a reality in one way or another. But our part, the part that relates to human beings, in verse 12, when God chooses us, predestines us, He does it so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of His glory. Who are the first to hope in Christ? Who, who is Paul saying are the first to hope in Christ? Who's, who, who are the we that he's talking about? The church. Yeah, right, the early church. In other words, the first converts, the first followers of Jesus Christ were the first to put their hope in Christ. And so what he's, what he's talking, he, he's not talking about future generations right now, he's talking about his generation. And he's saying that God called us, God predestined us, God gave us faith so that we might bring him honor and glory by being in a relationship with him. And when did this happen, according to verse 13? And you were included in Christ when? Three things happened here, according to verse 13. You were included in Christ when, one, you heard the word of truth. Second, well, no, that's the gospel of salvation is part of the word of truth. When you heard the word of truth, that's the gospel. And then two is having believed. So first you hear it, then you believe it. And then thirdly, you were marked with a seal, the Holy Spirit. And so, there, there's so much here. I mean, I think you could write an entire term paper on Ephesians chapter 1, because there's so much there. But, but that's not the assignment. We want your term papers to be broader 
But there's so much in those 14 verses because Paul, here Paul is calling the gospel of salvation the word of truth. So this is one reason why we have to keep preaching the gospel. Because according to Paul, it's the word of truth. And there is no salvation unless people hear the gospel. And so when, when you're thinking about the role of Christ in salvation, yes, Paul just said, Christ is supposed to be the head over all. But then he says, two verses later, that you and I only receive salvation when we hear the word of truth and believe it and receive the Spirit. And so what we find in Paul's theology here and in many other places is, is this relationship between what God has in his mind, God's plan, God's work, God's grace, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, the things that God does to bring us salvation. That is all on one side, one part of, of how God brings salvation. But the other dimension is our part. Not works, but our part is hearing the gospel, believing the gospel, accepting the gospel, following Christ. That's our part. And so it's so important when, you're, when we're studying Pauline theology to, to always go back and forth between these two sides of his theology. Everything that God does and everything that, that is required of us. Not, not to earn salvation, but to participate in it. Alright? And that's very important because this is how God has designed human nature. He doesn't just provide salvation without your knowing about it. He provides salvation apart from you but then you need to know about it. You need to hear the word of truth and respond to it. That's how God has designed things according to the Apostle Paul. Okay, that's a lot in those verses. A lot of theology. But it's a very important verse by verse to understand a lot of what Paul is thinking. Um, and that's why either this is Paul's writing to put together so many different ideas in one place or is someone after Paul looking back and say let's put all his thoughts together in 14 verses so that you can hear them clearly <laughs> all right let's go on go back to your notes now point number three believers have been sealed with the Holy Spirit and now there's an issue with this when do believers receive the Holy Spirit? And what does it mean to have the Holy Spirit? So you may want to discuss this in our discussion session uh, in, a, in a little while. But here's a note here about this. The Roman Catholic Church says infants are given the Holy Spirit at baptism. Evangelicals, Protestants, Baptists typically say that, say that it's at the moment of receiving Christ as Savior that you receive the Holy Spirit. When do Anglicans say? Baptism. At baptism. But, but infants are baptized. And so Anglicans are like Catholics. When do we receive the Spirit is a very big subject. And so I'm going to talk about that a number of times this semester. Uh, but here, I'm, we're, we're, I just have one comment here. Wherever you see TCG, what does that mean, refer to? Anybody have an idea? TCG. Timothy, Clarence, Jeffrey on. It's me. Okay. Those are my initials. So if you ever see TCG, it means my opinion. Okay, my opinion, my study. TCG says, the Spirit of God is the one who gives life to our mortal bodies. Spiritually, the Holy Spirit works in unseen ways, leading those who become believers to, to God and faith over time. This passage suggests that all believers are sealed with the Spirit in a way that is in addition to the Spirit of God that all human beings have. On occasion, there is a special anointing of the Holy Spirit that is different than the work of the Holy Spirit and that gives faith. 
The charismatic movement emphasizes this additional anointing. So in other words, all human beings have the Spirit of God. But what Paul teaches is that those who put their faith in God, in Christ, receive the Holy Spirit in a special way, in an additional way. And so this is sometimes a point of, of discussion among the modern theologians. They say, well, if everybody has the Spirit, then Christians shouldn't talk about we have the Spirit and other people don't have the Spirit. Don't, doesn't everybody have the Spirit? Yes and no. Everybody is alive by the Spirit of God. But Paul clearly teaches here and other places that, that we, we are sealed with the Spirit. We're given the Spirit in a way that, that wasn't possible before or apart from faith in Christ. All right. Number four, the gospel. Let's go now to Ephesians chapter 2. We're just going to go right through the whole book and get as far as we can. So Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Okay, this is a, these 10 verses are a marvelous summary of Romans chapters 1 through 8. All right, we, when you, Romans 1 through 8, so many verses, so much discussion. But here in these 10 verses, he summarizes the same theology. Again, another reason why I say uh, Ephesians really fits very well with the Apostle Paul's teaching elsewhere in Romans and Galatians. Well, we've already talked a lot about Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. Uh, but, but here I just want you to see these verses in context. Uh, we are all sinners, but by God's grace He offered us, brought to us salvation through Jesus Christ. Those who believe, who put their trust in Jesus, are those who are saved. Those who are saved are those who then go on to do good works for the rest of their lives. It's very simple, really. Uh, even though Romans is hard to understand, I don't think Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 is hard to understand. So this is a good place to go if you're trying to understand simply what is Paul's theology, especially his soteriology. All right, let's go on and look in verses 2, 11 through 22. Now, I'm, I won't take time to, to read all of these verses, but in these verses, what Paul is doing is he's, he's talking to the church or churches in the area of Ephesus. We're not sure exactly to whom he's writing. But he's talking about, he's talking to Gentiles. See, verse 11, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. Okay, verse 12, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. What is Paul's Old Testament theology for the Gentiles? Okay, never mind what you may have studied in Old Testament theology. What, is Paul, what did Paul think about the Gentiles before Christ? No hope, no hope at all. Okay, this is where the traditional Protestant theology and Catholic theology comes from, is that in Paul's argument here, he says, you Gentiles were excluded from the source of hope that came through the Jews. All right, see, in our modern world, modern theology, how many are LAP students, by the way? How many of you went to LAP? All right, only a few of you. Okay, you studied world religions, I'm sure. But, but, but very typically, when we study world religions today, we look at all the world's we, religions. We say, oh, there's Judaism and Hinduism and Buddhism and Confucianism and Christianity, etc. And we put them all on the table like, well, there's just all these different religions, which is accurate. There are, are all these religions. But that's not Paul's point of view. Paul doesn't say there are just a lot of different religions. 
and a lot of different ideas. Paul's point of view is that there's only one true religion. That was Judaism, originally. Why is it true? Because God chose to make the Jewish people his covenant people and to reveal his nature to them and to them alone. And so those outside of that covenant had no hope. They didn't know about God, the true God. They have gods, idols. They didn't know about the true God. So they were excluded. But now here's the important point. With Jesus Christ, things change. And that's when we get to verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, what? You who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. So again, what you have to get in your mind is that what we have is that Paul's, Paul's view of Judaism was very exclusive. So Paul's exclusivism wasn't Christian exclusivism. It was Jewish exclusivism. Because, and that's, and that's really fair reading of the Old Testament. Is that Jewish people believe they had the way. They, God had revealed to them. God, they are the recipients of the law. They, are the, they, they had the prophets. They had the truth about God. But they were exclusive. It was very difficult to join them. Some could join them, but not many did. And they didn't care if you joined or not. Because they really were very exclusive. But so Paul tells them, and let's pretend you are the, all the, the Christian, all the Gentiles in Ephesus. He's telling you, he says, there was a time when you were excluded from the gospel, excluded from God, excluded from the promises. But now, because of Jesus Christ, you are brought near. You have been included. So to use the language that's, that you're familiar with, that we will use over and over again this semester, Paul moves from exclusivism to inclusivism in his theology. But here's where there's often a misunderstanding. We need to understand what he means by inclusivism according to Ephesians. Inclusivism for Paul means that the Gentiles, non-Jews, are included now through the blood of Jesus Christ. So the question is, how, how does a Gentile then become included? Jesus Christ did the work on the cross. He shed the blood. But how does, how do, how does anybody in the world become included, according to the Apostle Paul? Well, let's keep reading. In verse 14, he begins to talk more about Christ. He says, for he, Christ, himself is our peace. He, he was made the two, one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Who are the two? Jews and Gentiles. Very good. So he's made the two, one. Now that includes the entire world now, because Gentiles are everyone who's not a Jew. So he's destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man, we could say person, one new person out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So again, God didn't just declare everybody's included. Right? Everyone's included. No. He started with the Jews and only the Jews were included. They were ex it was exclusive. Then he opened up salvation to the entire world, made it inclusive. But to do that, according to Paul, Christ had to die on the cross. So the cross is the important link between the exclusivism of Judaism and the inclusivism of Christianity. So 
So for Paul, there is no inclusivism without the cross. It's a very important part of his theology. Now 17, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Who, who was far away? The Gentiles. Who, who was near? Jews. So what's Paul doing here? He's explaining what he explained in Romans. It's God's will that the Jews and Gentiles are now included together in his plan of salvation. 18. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Uh, again, I, I, ho I hope you can see how much rich theology is here. This is not... Okay, God is not looking at the world and saying, all right, you're all included. Okay, good, all taken care of. No, he, he had that in his mind. But there had to be action taken. Christ had to come. Christ had to die. And, you see again, the word had to be preached. So remember I told you those two spheres? What God does and what humans experience. There's always both in Paul's theology. If you leave one out, you're not doing justice to his theology. The gospel has to be preached, even though God is the one that brings salvation. And the goal is to unite them. Alright, consequently, you... Gentiles are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens. Okay, where did we read about citizens? What book? Last time, Wednesday? Philippians. Philippians, very good. But fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which, Christ, in which God lives by his spirit. What, what God has made possible through Christ is that you and I now, through the Holy Spirit, can have access to God the Father. That's a relationship. So don't ever preach a gospel that says, well, God saved you, He forgave you, now you're good to go. Go on your way. That, that's, no. Preach a gospel that says Christ died for you, that's good news. Now, believe it and enter into relationship with God the Father through the Holy Spirit. It's that relationship that saves us ultimately. Somehow, in a mysterious way that I can't fully explain, the blood of Christ was necessary. But the blood of Christ is not the most important thing. It's important. But the most important thing is the new relationship. So now, let's take that to the modern context. Does this passage say... There is no dividing wall between Christianity and other religions. Because now Christ has broken down the dividing wall between Christians and Buddhists and Hindus. Is that what this passage is saying? Yes or no? Yes? No? I don't know. What? Yes? Got one yes. Anybody else? You can at least say, I don't know. <laughs> uh, the answer is no. In fact, it's absolutely no. This, this passage is used sometimes to make that point, and that's why I am talking about it. What this passage is saying is that the Jews were exclusive, the Gentiles were excluded, the Gentiles are included, through Christ, through faith in Christ, and through a relationship with the Father. If someone from another religion does not believe in Christ, 
does not have a relationship with God the Father, does not have the Holy Spirit, this cannot possibly apply to them. It cannot possibly apply to them. In its context, this verse, these verses are talking about Jews and Gentiles, the movement from, from exclusivism to inclusivism through Christ. It is not talking about a movement from exclusive Christianity to inclusive pluralism. Because there's no, there's no basis for that bridge in these verses. Nalila? Okay, this is important. Because I want your theology, especially in this class, but for all time, I want your theology to be based on the New Testament teaching. And for that, you need to read it carefully so that you properly interpret and apply these verses. What do you mean the blood's not important? And, and what exactly you're saying? So let me, let me try to say that again. The blood of Christ is very important. But the blood is the means to an end. All right? So, it, so here's 10,000 jets. All right? So 10,000 jets. Uh, everybody wants to have 10,000 jets, right? Okay, sure, yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not giving to you. <laughs> but, but let's say I gave you 10,000 jets. What would you do with it? Would you just hold it and say, oh, I love my 10,000 jets. What would you do with it? You, 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 <laughs> you, 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 you buy some food? Books. Yeah, I might buy some books. Okay. Yeah, you might buy some books. You might buy some food. You might buy some clothes. So the thing you want is the, is the books or the, or the food or the clothes. That's what's important. The money is the means to get that. So this is not the important thing, but you have to have it. So same way, the blood of Christ is like our money that buys our forgiveness, that buys our renewed relationship with God. So you have to have it. You have to have the blood, but that's... That's a means to the end of what's really important, and that's the relationship with God. So what does that mean practically? When you're preaching the gospel, yes, we have to preach about the blood of Christ. Because that's, that's how God brought about our salvation, through Christ. But the blood of Christ is not the final point. The forgiveness of sins is what was bought with the, with the, with the, the blood. But even, even the forgiveness of sins isn't the final, final point. What's the final point, the most important thing? What is the most important thing? What is, it, what is the blood and forgiveness, what does that really do for us? Yeah, salvation, but what, what is salvation? According to Paul. Yes, a right, eternal relationship with God. I think this is one reason we might have trouble in some of our churches. We preach Christ's death and forgiveness, and, and, and it's like, say, and they go, great, yeah, give me the jets. Thank you, thank you for my forgiveness. Now I'll go back to my life. We just say, whoa, 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 wait. No, forgiveness is so that you'll have a relationship with God. Now, let me explain to you what a relationship with God means. And that's salvation. That's life. That's eternal life. Is our relationship with God. That's Paul's theology. So don't, don't just look at the blood. Don't just look at forgiveness. Don't just look at ideas, theology, or philosophy. Because all of it is intended to lead to the most important thing eternal life in relationship with God. That's why you were created. That's why He chose you. That's why He adopted you. To be a son and daughter. I'm a father. I have two sons. I want to be in relationship with them forever. Alright? That's what God wants for you. Now, in, in 
point number six in your outline is the gospel means spiritual richness in Christ for all. And I wish we had time to, to look at every verse, but we don't. Uh, but there's, in, in chapter 3, beginning of verse 14, he has a prayer for the Ephesians. And this is that famous prayer where he prays that, that they would know the, the height and depth and the width, the length and width of the love of Christ. So, when Paul prays that they may know the love of God like this, I want you to see again. See verse 16 here. I pray out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Okay, you see, salvation is not just about forgiveness. It's about moving from alienation from God to a relationship with God that is then characterized by what? Verse 16, the power of God. What else? Verse 17, the love of God. And so Paul's theology, Paul's understanding of the Christian life Again, it's all of what God does for you, but your experience begins by hearing, believing, receiving, and then experiencing more and more the power of God, the love of God, so that your life is transformed. <clears throat> and then now, let's go to chapter 4. If my life is transformed and your life is transformed, what should we do? Well, according to verse 3, well, two, be completely humble and gentle, patient and bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. He talks about there's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So Paul did believe that there's only one God. And he did believe that he's overall. But he doesn't believe that everybody knows that God. Right? So to know that God and have a relationship God with that God, the Heavenly Father, requires knowing Christ in Paul's theology. So verse 7, but to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So then he goes on. I'm not going to go to that. But let's go to verse 11. Now you know these verses because there are theme verses for this year. It was he who gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So, which theological category do these verses belong to? Is it theology, Christology, pneumatology, ecclesiology, ethics, what? Which one of those? He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Well, I think it's a little tricky. But that's Paul's theology. They're all connected. Okay? But it is saying something about God the Father gave... Well, here it says... Um, it was really talking about Christ gave some... So it's really Christology, first of all. But most of all, it's ecclesiology. He's talking about the church. This is what the church is. All right, and I think I'm going to press this here, but for those of you who grew up with a very traditional idea of church, which, which Christianity and church means the, village, the, the building we have in our village and 
and all of our traditions, that's not Paul's idea of church. That you're describing a church building or you're describing a tradition. And that's, that's important. But for Paul, church is something that's alive. It's, it's dynamic. It's something that exists not because there are rules and regulation in history. The church exists because Christ makes it exist. The church exists because Christ is in you through His Holy Spirit. And because the Spirit is among us, the church is real. We don't need a building. Right? We, need, we need the Spirit. That's what makes the church. We need Christ and the Spirit. And then, what is the nature of that church? What Paul is saying here, anyway, that it's filled with people who have gifts to serve the church, to build up the church. One of the things that you're going to think about here at seminary is what is the purpose of the church? What is the purpose of mission? All right, these are questions that are discussed here a lot. What is Paul saying the primary purpose of the church is according to these verses? What's the primary purpose of the gifts of the Spirit? Now, not, we're not talking about numerically if you have 50 people going to 100 people, that's a different kind of growth. We're talking, no matter how many people you have, growth is spiritual growth. You become more like Christ. Albert, write down your questions. Write them down and you will get a chance to ask your questions. Okay, we're talking about the growth of the church. Spiritual growth is growth in relationship with Christ. Preparation for service. So that the body of Christ may be built up. Okay, 15, speaking the truth and the love, we will on all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Okay, the church is alive and healthy when Christ is at the center and the Holy Spirit's at work in the members. Not just praising God, but in loving each other, in serving each other, in helping one another become more and more like Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of the church. And if you and I put the effort, make the effort to grow spiritually, not as individuals, but as a church, as a community of believers, we then become a stronger witness to the non-believing world. So if you want to show the Buddhists in your neighborhood Christ or the Christian way, the best way you can do that is by having a good relationship with Christ yourself. By your church having good relationships, loving relationships with each other. And then they will see with their eyes that there's something good in your community. Then they will be convinced by the reality, not your words, not your ideas, but the reality that you are humble, you're gentle, you're kind, you're peace-loving, and you work towards harm with, for harmony with one another. That's Paul's theology. That's Paul's ecclesiology. Now, at this point, he's not talking about witness. All right? So we talk a lot about that here. Missiology is very important. But, but Paul's not talking about that in these verses. So this is still foundational for the church. All right, so you can read more notes for yourself. When we get to verse 17, he begins his practical instruction for how they should live. So this first part of the, of the letter, I mean, the, the, a big portion of the letter was really about his theology, including Christology and Soteriology and Ecclesiology. But now he's going to move to the more of the practical section where he's teaching them about Christian living. And there's a lot here, a lot of, of rich, meaty material. So let me just highlight a couple of uh, several items. 
So 417, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. So you, you have to have, I'm going to stand again, maybe it helps. You sort of have to have this idea that, uh, I don't know an easy way to, to demonstrate, it have to do with words. But remember we had the, the Jews, a small group, Gentiles, a big group, Christ comes into the world, dies on the cross, the gospel goes out to these people, and those who accept the gospel are now included with the promises of God. Jews, believing Jews in Christ, Jews who believe in Christ, Gentiles who believe in Christ, now form a new group called the church, which is really the, the new Israel in Paul's thinking. But there are still many, 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 many Gentiles who do not believe in Jesus Christ. Many, many religions, many beliefs, they're not, they're not included. Not because Paul excludes them, but because they did not, did not welcome the invitation to join the group. Because the invitation was open to all. Some didn't know about it, but some rejected it. So, what Paul is saying to the Gentiles, who are now in this new group, the new Israel, he's saying, now that you're in this group, you must no longer live as those Gentiles who are outside this group. So it might be confusing to you, he's talking to Gentiles, he says, don't live like Gentiles. But he means two different groups of Gentiles. And Paul's general belief is that the Gentiles, by and large, who did not know God, the true God, did not have hope, lived the kind of life that was full of what the new Israel would call sin, moral depravity. He says, now that you're in this group, you must no longer live this way. And so what does he say? He, he says, those people outside, they're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. What does that sound like? Romans chapter 1. Do you remember? We talk about Romans chapter 1 where God gave them over. Well here he says they gave themselves over. But the end result's the same. That, that because they did not want to consider the truth about God, they blocked it out of their minds. They, lit, they, 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 they embarked upon this journey that's like a downward spiral into greater and greater evil. He says, that's the way they live. That should not be the way you live. And that's verse 20. He says, you, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you have heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, this way over here, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Right? This is the new life in Christ. New life in Christ means honesty, purity, truthfulness, goodness, righteousness, love. All the things we talked about. It's a new way of life. So let me recap again what I've been saying tonight from Paul's teaching in Ephesians. Everyone was lost. The Jews first had a chance of hope because they received the law and the covenants. Through Christ, the gospel has been introduced through Christ's death, resurrection, His blood. There's now hope, not only for Jews, but for all those who put their faith in Christ. That's the redemption. That's forgiveness. That's the gospel message. That's the good news. All of this was in God's mind before the beginning of time. 
He chose you to become His children. He made it happen through Christ. But here's this movement in God's mind, in God's actions. But we always get to our response. Our experience. So what did I say? You have to hear the gospel. You have to believe the gospel. You have to accept the gospel. You have to accept Jesus Christ. And what happens when you accept Christ? Yes, your sins are forgiven. But what did I say is the most important thing? Beyond forgiveness is a new... What comes from forgiveness? What did Christ buy for us? A what? The blood of Christ. But what did, he, what did that get us? Eternal life in relationship with God forever. Okay, so that, so you see, this is the movement. No hope, some hope, more hope, forgiveness, redemption, eternal life through, through God. Now, in chapter 4, he's saying, you have all this in Christ. So live like it. Live like it. You're not finished yet. God didn't just save you so that you could be forgiven. So you could have a relationship with Him and so that you could live a new life for Him and for other people. So with your gospel, with your theology, keep going. Don't stop. There's a whole theology here that goes to complete transformation. That's God's will. Chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6 talks about in more detail what this transformation looks like. And every one of us struggles with that. Every one of us still, part of us still wants to live the old way. But our calling, your calling, my calling, according to Paul, is to put off the old self change the attitude, be renewed in the attitude of our minds, and put on the new self, created to be like Christ Jesus. That's your daily mission. That's your daily assignment. Is to keep struggling in that battle against sin so that you can put on Christ and live like Christ. That's, that's the kind of church, that's the kind of saved person that honors God and pleases God. So many examples here in chapter 4. We can go on. Uh, chapter 5. Again, here he is again. Verse 1. Be imitators of God as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and service to God. See, to use a traditional philosophical category, this is ethics. But remember, for Paul, ethics is not human beings deciding to be good and noble human beings. For Paul, ethics require a transformed life in relationship with Christ so that through the power of the Holy Spirit, now we can live a new life. Now we can talk about ethics. Now we can do good things. That's the flow of Paul's theology here. And so he talks about some of what that means in chapter 5. Uh, and then he talks about uh, submitting to one another. And he uses some traditional categories. Wives submitting to husbands. Husbands love their wives. Children submit to their parents. Now one more thing before we go to Colossians. It seems quite fitting to me that Paul ends his well, or, or, or towards the end of his letter, he talks about what is sometimes called spiritual warfare. How many have heard that phrase, spiritual warfare? Raise your hand. Spiritual warfare, spiritual battle. Okay, only four people. Do you have another name for it? Okay, okay this is very important for understanding Paul, but it's very important for your spiritual life. Paul says that there are real spiritual forces in the world that are evil forces that are trying to work against you to keep you from following God's will. And ultimately, 
the devil and the spiritual forces, these evil spiritual forces, would like to destroy you. That's ultimately, that's what sin does. Sin destroys you. The tempter wants to destroy you, either by your own sin or by uh, falling victim to somebody else's sin. It's, it's the complete opposite of what God wants. God, through Christ, came to give you life. The devil, through his demons, wants to give you death. Right? These are just opposites. Now you know, I, I think a little bit, from your, your study of your history of your own people or, or Buddhism. Is there, there have been, historically, in your own backgrounds, there was a belief in, in spirits, animism, right? You believed in tree spirits, and rock spirits, and house spirits. Well, Buddhists today, many Buddhists today, still believe in those kinds of spirits, or gnats, right? And so this is, you know, it's, it's quite involved, all the different beliefs about spirits. So the Christian gospel never said there weren't spirits. We never said that. It's not, the Bible doesn't say there aren't spirits, evil spirits. The Bible says you don't have to be afraid of evil spirits if you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. There's only one great spirit, and that's God. There's only one purely Holy Spirit, and that's the spirit that comes from God. And so your theology is more complete if you recognize that, that as a people you've been freed from the superstition of your past. You know, being so concerned that, oh, there might be a spirit anywhere. You know, maybe, maybe in this eraser. Ah! Okay, don't touch that eraser. Okay. So, I mean, that's extreme, right? We don't think like that. But we still, we still think that in the darkness, in the world, unseen to us, are forces that work against us. Now, not everybody believes that. And many people in the West don't believe it at all. But I do. Because I experience that battle all the time. And so Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, which we don't really find in any detail in the other letters, is this detail about our struggle, verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. All right, I, you, I, I don't know what you believe, and I don't know what you've been taught, but you will find many, many people, especially in the West, but even here, who say, I don't believe in evil spirits. No. Okay, Paul did. And no matter what you believe about the spirits, I think you will agree with me that every one of us experiences a battle with darkness. Would you agree with me on that? Yes. Yeah, we have a, a battle that we experience. And so what's important for you to, re one thing that's important for you to realize is that you're not alone. So you may go from here and say, oh, I've got this temptation, or I've got this battle, or I'm, I think dark thoughts, or I'm discouraged, I want to give up, I want to quit. Uh, Joe Mintoon committed suicide. So yesterday in chapel, you know, uh, Sam Ken Chu Chu said he passed away. But the truth is he committed suicide. But I have to tell you, that a person that commits suicide has been swallowed up in darkness. I don't, I don't blame him, I don't criticize him, I love him. Okay, but, but I'm sad for him. And that's an extreme example of what the devil wants to do in this world. To swallow us up in darkness. So that you quit, or you give up, or you let yourself be controlled by your sinful nature. And that will ultimately destroy you and your loved ones and the church and everything that's important to you. So what can you do? You have to fight. You have to fight. You know, we talk a lot in this world about fighting you know, military sources or fighting neighbors or fighting you know, uh, terrorism in the world. That's a different kind of fight. This kind of fight is about a spiritual fight. 
And that's something that you and I are called to learn how to fight. That's, that's a whole other lecture for me to, to go into detail. I just want to at least show you that here is a significant passage that says, yes, darkness is real. Yes, you have to fight. But thirdly, every one of us has hope to win the battle because of Christ in us. Okay, that's Ephesians. All right? You see, there's a lot in Ephesians. That's my favorite book. All right, my favorite book of the Bible to preach from. Uh, and, and when I was a pastor of a church, I spent a whole year just preaching from the book of Ephesians because there's so much there to build up the church. Okay? Albert, you have to wait, buddy. Okay, hang on. All right, let's go and talk. We're going to talk about Colossians now. And then, uh, then we're going to do our small groups and then we'll do questions. All right, now Colossians... Let me give you the overview here in your guide. Colossians with Ephesians is thought to be Deutero-Paul, as I said before. The theology and themes fit well with Paul's undisputed writings. But some of the language seems out of place. Scholars then study Colossians with Paul, but acknowledge that it may represent a later development of his thought by those of his school. Now, I don't think Paul actually had a school. That's, that's why I say quote-unquote. In other words, those who followed him, those who learned from him. Now, let me highlight the main point, the main point of difference or development. It's in the area of Christology. So in Ephesians, we had more theology, more Christology, more soteriology, more ecclesiology. There's so much in Ephesians. But Colossians has some of the same material and maybe they borrow from each other. We don't know. But there are a number of verses they have that are identical verses in both. But that's not the important thing now. I think the most important thing for you to see in Colossians is his exalted or raised Christology. Higher than what we find in any of the other writings of Paul. And so for that we're going to look at Colossians 1, 15 through 23. That'll be our main focus. This is another super rich passage. Uh, so much in here. So I want you to be, as we read, looking for what does this passage say about Jesus Christ according to Paul. Alright? This is... Uh, one of the most beautiful passages in the New Testament that focuses on Jesus Christ. So, what do you see here? Let's take verse by verse. What does verse 15 say about who Jesus Christ is? Okay, he's the image of the invisible God. Okay, why is that so important? Because what Paul is saying is, this is how we know who, who God is. And we have the Old Testament, we have the laws and the prophets. And so we know a lot about God. But now our knowledge about God is greatly increased through Jesus Christ. And so who else has it been said that they are the image of the invisible God? That may be a trick question. <laughs> Nobody. Nobody. We are made in the image of God. But that's not what he means here. What he's saying, because if he was talking about all human beings made in the image of God, there would be no point of saying Jesus was also in the image of God. Because that's the saying, he's one more person among many. No, he's trying to say that what we see in Jesus is that we see something about God that we could not see otherwise. So, should, according to Paul, would Paul say that Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and Vishnu were, were, were all about the same. Would he say they are? Yes or no? Okay, don't believe that. When you hear that from some, some uh, teachers, theologians, or books you read, uh, John Hick, for example, uh, don't, don't believe it. You say, well, Jesus was one, but we have lots of great people in history. That's true. But it's not what Paul believes. So you're going to have to decide in the end 
If you're going to believe John Hick or you're going to believe the Apostle Paul. So really? Is it really that? Yeah, I think it is. I've been studying this for many years and you know, and I realized that some of the some of the the theologians really are presenting their a new religion. It's their own religion. It's not the historic Christianity. It's not what the Bible teaches. It's what they want to believe for whatever reason. Read them. Read John Hick. He's interesting. Okay? He's got some good points. He's very smart. I think you can learn a lot from John Hick, but I think he's wrong. So, okay? I think he's wrong about the most important thing. And that's who Jesus Christ is and his role in the world. So, uh, this year I'm being very bold and telling you exactly what I think. <laughs> and you can go to other class and learn something else, but I'm going to tell you what I think too. But, I, but I'm showing you from Scripture why I think that. For Paul, he's saying there's nobody like Jesus. Nobody. And then he goes on in verse 16. He says, what? For by him all things were created. Is everybody back there? Are you following along? We're reading. Verse 16. I want you to read it, think about it, answer the question. For by Christ all things were created. <laughs> what Paul is doing, he's putting Jesus back with God the Father at the beginning of time to join in the creation. That sounds like John, right? John has that high exalted Christology. And so Paul, we haven't seen that in Paul, really, not in Romans or Galatians or his other letters, but here in Colossians, all of a sudden he moves up here. That's why some people don't think Paul wrote it. Because they think, wow, this is really high Christology. But that's what we're, today we're looking at the text. The text says, yes, the writer of Colossians believes that Jesus Christ, not, not Jesus the, in the flesh, but the pre-existent Jesus before the incarnation. Somehow the Son of God was with the Father. That's how theologians explain it. He was with for all time and before time. The Son was with the Father. And together they created the universe. Alright? And, and then so 117, He's before all things. And in Him all things hold together. So the word that's often used in theology is that he's the sustainer. So he creates and he sustains. He makes it happen and he holds it together. The deist, have you heard of that? Deist Thomas Jefferson, famous uh, early American politician and leader, was a deist. They believed that, that God was like a clockmaker. He built a clock, wound it up, click, 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 and then let it go. And then, I don't know where God went, but he left, okay? And so we're just like tick, 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 tick. The world's just going, going, going. And I can understand why some people would believe that. But that's not what Paul believes. What Paul believes is that even though you have a life, I have a life, it's my life, your life, but you, you could have no life if God didn't keep you alive. That spirit that gives you life is someday going to depart from you and you're going to be gone. I mean, your life will be gone. Now your soul go, continues on by God's grace. But everything you see in the world is sustained by God's power. And, the, and for Paul, he's including Christ in that. Okay, then he goes on, 18, he says he's the head of the body, the church, the body of Christ. The head of the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn among the dead. So in other words, he's the, he's the one who was resurrected unto eternal life. And as such, we consider him the first. And all of us hope and pray for the same thing for us. That when this life is over, we too will be resurrected. But so that in everything he might have the supremacy. All right, this is not very different from Philippians chapter 2. Remember, I said Jesus Christ did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, 
but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. Remember that? Philippians chapter 2. He humbled himself, and, but God exalted him to the place that's the highest place. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Right? That's Philippians 2, 6 through 11. Even though Philippians doesn't have the same language as Colossians, he's really hinting at the same thing, isn't he? Christ existed before he was Jesus, Jesus on earth, Jesus of Nazareth. Because he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself. That's the incarnation. So I think what we see in Colossians, an exalted form, really is in the undisputed Paulines. It's in Philippians chapter 2. And the same idea of exaltation is here. So that, but here the language is, so that he might have the supremacy. That's the highest place. But now, in case you didn't believe me, on verse 15, about what it means for, for Jesus to be the image of the invisible God. Some of you maybe didn't believe me. I saw the doubts in your eyes. Okay? <laughs> verse 19 says, For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him. So here, this verse explains the earlier verse. So in Jesus we see God. This, then, is another reason why your gospel has to include Jesus. Don't just preach God. You have to preach Jesus because it's by Jesus we know who God is. It's not Jesus or God. It's Jesus and God together. All right. And then 120. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Here we are again. Ephesians chapter 1. Same idea. Peace is made through the blood. Peace is made by the cross. But now, notice this. It's God's pleasure to reconcile to himself all things. This is a good verse for the inclusivists. So what I'm going to be eventually arguing for you later on this semester is that an, ex what, uh, an exclusive view is the best representation of what we find in the New Testament. But there are a number of verses that point to an inclusive view. Very, very few, if none, for pluralistic view. But inclusive view, yes. And so, as you do your theology, inclusivism has to be part of your vocabulary because it, it's part of Paul's concept. He intends that, that the gospel is for everybody. And he preaches that God intends, it's God's will, God's desire to reconcile, that means people who are alienated brought together, everything. That's inclusivism in the extreme. Is that going to be what God actually does? Or is that just what God would like to have happen? Because remember, I, as I said several times, there is this relationship between what God has in his mind, what God accomplishes by his power and will, even God's sovereignty, to bring to pass the things he determined to bring to pass. And yet, in Scripture, in Paul, there's always this other sphere of our response. And if we reject Christ, if we do not accept the salvation he offers freely through Christ, will we still be saved? Will we still be included? Even though that's his desire, will we still be included? That's what I want you to think about this semester. Okay, because I think all of this discussion comes down to that. We know God wants people included. But we also know that there's many verses that say there are many people who are rejected, who reject Him. And ultimately will have no place in the kingdom of God. Okay. Alright, now we're uh, 21. Again, same thing we find in, in Ephesians 
watch. Once we were, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your, because of your evil behavior. Remember, the old Gentile behavior, new Gentile behavior. He says that's how you were. So don't go back there. Don't go back there. You're in, you're new in Christ now. But now he has reconciled you to God by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Now, 23, there seems to be a condition. What is the condition according to 23? you understand what I mean by condition? So God has provided this huge salvation through Christ, included the whole world, and these people to whom he's writing have accepted that, they believe it, they've experienced it. It's real. But what is what do they need to still do according to this, 23? To keep firmly in their faith in God. So if you continue in your faith, if you continue in your faith. So I could say to you, if I want to apply this to you, I think Everyone here is a follower of Christ, I hope. Okay, if you came to the seminary. Uh, if you're not, that's where you should start. Uh, put your faith in Jesus Christ. But if you've done that, and you do that, then Paul would say to you, you're saved. You have, you have the hope of eternal life. You have a relationship with God. You are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. That's a, that's a, a concrete statement of fact. But he would also say to you, but you must continue in your faith. Because if you give up your faith, you lose your faith. You lose your salvation. Now, how many of you have studied John Calvin? Anybody? Do you know who John Calvin is? You should have heard of John Calvin in church history or in, in theology. I hope so. Okay, very important person. Martin Luther, John Calvin. Okay. John Calvin believed in, he emphasized the things we've been teaching tonight. Predestination. God chooses you to be saved. He even says, you can't lose your salvation. How, how can that be if 23 says you have to continue in your faith? Does anybody know? Anybody know what John Calvin's answer is? This is important. He says, if God gave you the grace to believe in Christ, He also gives you the grace to continue to believe in Christ. It's called the perseverance of the saints. To persevere means I don't give up. There can be no question Paul teaches perseverance. You're not saved once and then you can forget about it because you're taken care of. No, Paul would never teach that. He says, yes, you're saved at a moment in time, but you have to hold on to that faith for the rest of your life. But don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Because God will give you the grace to hold on. All right? All right, so that's Colossians. We're going to take a five-minute break. Only five for stretching. All right? And then come back, go to small groups. By now, you know how to do your small groups. I didn't put it in the guide here, but just, I want you to do two things. Just, just spend 10 minutes saying, what was important about tonight? What did you hear in Ephesians and Colossians that's important to you? Okay, maybe, maybe you agree, maybe you disagree, but talk about it. And then, what question do you have? And then I'll, I'll do as I did before and I'll put all the questions on the board. All right, five minute break, then go to small groups. Christians grow up in every way. So, what should we do to grow up? Well, growth is an ongoing process. So, for example, if you if you have a, a an eight-year-old little sister, you don't say to her, "Why don't you grow up?" <laughs> Maybe you do. Okay, but you shouldn't. <laughs> All right, because. In fact, your brains are not fully developed until you're 25. How many of you are, are 25 or older? Raise your hand. Okay, so you're fully developed. How many of you are under 25? 
Younger. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> okay, okay. But what, what that means for those under 25 is that you are actually going to see that you're going to think a little bit differently in a couple of years because your brain is still forming. Uh, my point is this. It takes time to grow up. It takes time. And so a lot of the lack of maturity we see is just, it's not enough time. And I, I think I'm going to be growing up in Christ all my life till the day I die. I hope, I hope I keep growing because I need to keep growing. Uh, I've grown, but I need more. There's another reason, too, is, is that, and this goes with the second part of that question. We're, another reason we don't grow up is we're not, we're not using the spiritual tools we have, the resources. Paul says that Christ gave some to be apostles and prophets and teachers and pastors. Those individuals are, we need them to help us grow up when they speak to us, when they teach us. We have, we have scripture, we have prayer, and prayer practices, we have spiritual warfare. We have to work at growing up and we need the help of other people. You can't grow up by yourself. You need the church to help you, for the church to grow up, for you to grow up as a member of the church. What is, number two, what is the will of God for those who have never heard the gospel? I don't know. <laughs> That's my question too. Uh, I'm not, uh, but, but, le but let me say that there are, there are some theologians that f believe very strongly that we, we should answer that question. And I think that the, you know, among those who are, who really try to base their theology heavily in the Bible, I mean, all Christian theologians use the Bible. But, but some really stress it more than others. And some would say uh, they're lost. Those who do not hear the gospel will die in their sins. And in fact, that was the motivation for Christian missions. Why, why did missionaries uh, go out in the world? It's because they believed that, that you and I would be lost I mean, condemned forever if we didn't have the gospel. So that's, that's not out of sync with what Paul teaches. I, I tend to be of a, of a little different point of view. Without, without rejecting that view, I think that's possible based on the way Paul lived his life. He was, seemed absolutely convinced that he had to bring the gospel to people. And in fact, he says in Romans chapter 9 and 10, so how, how will they know if they don't hear? How will they hear if, if they ha isn't preaching? So he, he really believed there had to be preaching. At the same time, the God of the Bible is a God of justice and mercy. And so what I say to myself is, I trust those people in the hands of a merciful, loving God. And I trust Him to do the right thing. And whatever God decides, God decides. It's not up to me to decide the fate of other people. I'm not the judge. So, I trust that God will do the right thing. It's like babies who die, or small children die before they know the gospel. It's the same thing. I trust in God's mercy and grace. But having said that, I believe that it's really important for us to follow the example of Paul and the teaching of Paul that we need to bring the gospel to the world. And just because we can't understand about people we never met doesn't mean that we shouldn't follow the teaching that Paul gives us or that Jesus gave us in the Great Commission to take the gospel to the world. So I follow the explicit teaching while I say there's some things I don't understand. Okay, number three. Why did Paul say that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation if he is the creator? This is a good question. 
Here I think firstborn means he is in the supreme position. It doesn't mean that he was created first. I mean, in fact, the, the church wrestled with this question. When I mean the church is the early church fathers, the theologians, they wrestled with these questions. And they decided that, that Jesus Christ was not created. He was born but not created. So he existed forever with God is how the early church answered this question. And so, to explain this verse, I had to say that even though he's not part of creation because he's the creator, he still was among the created people and so he's first among all others. I think that's the right interpretation. And that goes along with what I said earlier too, that Jesus has no equals. And so I will never talk about Jesus, Buddha, Vishnu, um, Muhammad, Moses, you know, just say, well, they're all religious leaders. That's, that's not what Paul teaches, so I, I don't talk that way. Uh, if the gospel is for all, what happens to those who are not born again? You know, that's the same kind of question from before. Scripture really doesn't give us much hope for people who aren't born again. I think that we sometimes want to have hope for people who aren't born again because it makes us feel better, right? I, I don't want to think about my brother who's rejected the gospel. I don't want to think about him as not being saved. I don't want to think about you know, neighbors or friends who, who either don't... Well, all the people I know have heard of the gospel because I, I come from the West and everybody has heard the gospel. But that doesn't mean they've understood it. It doesn't mean that they, they really experienced the right kind of preaching. We don't really know what people have heard and, or understood. So I would feel better if I, if I believed everybody was going to be saved. That, that would make me feel better. Uh, but I, I don't get that teaching from Scripture. And so again, I'm left with, I don't really know about what happened. It's going to happen. But the, the teaching of Jesus, the teaching of Paul, the example of Paul says it's really important that I preach the gospel because people's destiny does depend on it. And so I have, that's my obedience. I have to do it. You know, I'm sorry that some of these questions, I can't give you a definitive answer. But that, that's the nature of New Testament theology. There are some things we don't have the answer for. So don't think that I didn't go to school or something. It's, it's just that some things aren't fully answered in the Bible. And, or they're answered in a couple different ways. And so we're left with not being sure. What did Paul mean by predestination? I, I, I tried to answer that before. That means he decided before you were born that he was going to make you his child. That, that leads to the question of, what about double predestination? Have you heard of double predestination? Okay, single predestination is he chose you to be his child. But what about all those people he didn't choose? Well then, in effect, he predestined them to not be his child. Whoa, we don't like that one. Okay, most of us don't like it. If you like that idea, you have a problem. Okay? I mean, you don't have much of a heart if you like the idea that God predestined some people to go to hell. Alright, so I hope we don't preach that. Alright, it's very, it's very unkind. But I think it's enough to preach that God did call some people to be his children. And those who don't accept, it's a mystery. And so, biblically, Paul would probably say they weren't called. But when we read Romans 9 through 11, you can tell he's heartbroken about his own people. He said, oh, I wish they would only accept the gospel. So he was never calm about double predestination. He just said, God chooses, God calls, and for those who accept, that's a good thing. It's supposed to give you confidence and, and hope and strength. But when it comes to people who, who aren't believers, for him, his heart is broken. And he, he earnestly wants them to believe. And so he acts as if their salvation depends on him. 
That's how he acts. So I think that's how we're supposed to act. Take confidence that God has called us because we believe. But for those who don't believe, we have to, our hearts need to be broken. And we need to do everything we can to bring them the gospel. But we have to realize we can't force anybody. Only God can bring somebody to faith. Number six, why does God create those who are not predestined to be saved? I don't know. Okay. In Romans chapter 9, Paul addresses this question a little bit. He says that, you should write that down if you care about this, to so look at it later, Romans 9. What he says is, theoretically, he says, what if God prepared something, someone, just to destroy them? He's saying, what he was saying is, God could do that if he wants. It's God's choice. He's the creator. So he could choose some to be children and some to be destroyed. Now, he doesn't say that God did that. But he says, hypothetically, God could do that. And so we're left with, again, being uncertain. Um, the one biblical example that comes to mind right away is Pharaoh. Do you remember the story of Pharaoh, of course? Do you remember that it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Why did God do that? Do you remember? Did you study that in Old Testament theology? God hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let Israel go. Why not? Because according to the text, God wanted to do those ten miracles, ten plagues. Why did God want to do that? So that God would be glorified. And so now, 3,000 years later, we're still telling the story about the Exodus. Right? We're still telling the story about the marvelous deeds of God to deliver His people. And that story has become, like, the most significant symbol of God liberating His people. And so it's become the central story for liberation theology, for example. Black theology in, in America. They focus on the Exodus story. That's how important that story is. That story would not be important if Pharaoh's... That, that story wouldn't have happened if God hadn't hardened Pharaoh's heart. If Moses had said, hey, how about letting my people go? And he said, yeah, sure, go. You know, not much story there. <laughs> okay, but there was a big story. They kept fighting, 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 fighting. And so that story is, is the best I can do for you to say that if God hardens somebody's heart, he has a reason. There's some other purpose for it. But my prayer and hope is that he'll still be merciful to that person. But I don't know. I can't say for sure. Because if you read the Bible, especially the Old Testament, there are a lot of people who died early because of the judgment of God. So that's a fact. So a lot of people die in this world. So what does that mean? Now I'm getting a little beyond this question. But this is important. I don't think God cares about people dying as much as we do. And you go, whoa, well, what do you mean? Well, everybody dies. Everybody dies. He doesn't stop it. So if he gives you a few more years, Hezekiah got 15 more years, but he still died. And it really was a bad deal because 15 more years for him brought Manasseh into the world and he was the most wicked, one of the most wicked kings. I think God is comfortable with a lot of death. And I think that the reason for that is that A, he has an eternal perspective. And I think B, if we don't do what he wants us to do, he doesn't have a purpose for us. That's, that should be very sobering. And stop and realize that you and I, we're not the center of the universe. God is. 
And so it's our job to know who this God is, to receive from Him what He wants to offer to us, and then to follow and obey. That's our best chance for life in this life. Okay. How can we explain to church members about spiritual warfare? I think what I would do, I mean, this is tricky because some people get very afraid. And we don't want our people in our church to be afraid so that they're, they're going home and they're looking out the window and looking for spirit. We don't want that. That's not good. But we want people to feel like they have power. So I think what I, what I would do is just talk about the experience they have struggling with darkness, right? That's why I asked all of you, I said, Can, have you experienced darkness in your life? Many of you said yes. So I think I would start there and say, what, what darkness is in your life? When do you feel overwhelmed with temptation? When do you feel overwhelmed with a critical, negative, judgmental attitude? When does the world look black and dark? When are you filled with hatred and violence? All right, these are all the signs of darkness. When are you so filled with lust and, and desire that, that you would throw away your life in order to do what you, what's wrong? You know, those are the signs of darkness. So that's warfare. I think they can understand that. So talk about the battle, the spiritual battle, and then talk about what are our resources, what are our spiritual tools that we have. And that, in my book called, uh, entitled Saying Yes to God, and I, well, I don't know if I, I guess I haven't talked to you about my books yet, but Saying Yes to God is one of my books. And I talk, try to talk about the, the daily spiritual life in that book. And I talk about what I call the daily battle. Because in my experience, I'm battling the forces of evil every day. I don't think it has to be a demon. But I know it's a battle. And so talk about the battle with people. And talk about the struggle. And be honest with the people and say, I know you struggle. I struggle. You struggle. How can we be victorious? How can we overcome? And that's where the teaching about growing up in Christ, the teaching about putting on the Christ, rejecting the old, that's where the teaching about the Holy Spirit comes in. Okay. How can we know if we're successful in spiritual warfare? Well, what do you think? If we live in the light, as He is in the light, we're successful. If we live in the darkness, what, by which I mean the, 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 the sinful nature, the old nature, then we're unsuccessful. And so that's the, the best passage to read uh, that I think that spells that out is Galatians chapter 5. So if you're interested in this, read Galatians chapter 5. He says the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. And he gives you a whole list. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit are also obvious. You're successful when you're living by the Spirit. You're unsuccessful when you're living by the darkness. And by the way, nobody is successful all the time. So our goal should be to become more successful, to kind of get out of the darkness more and more. And I find in my life over my years, many years, more than yours, that God has really delivered me from some things. But there are other things that are still, like, hold on to me, that are hard to, to escape from. And they make me sad, they make me discouraged, but it's real. I still am not as successful as I'd like to be. Sometimes I fail, and that's sad. I mean, it's really, it's troubling. But that seems to be the real life. So that's why I preach what I preach to you, teach what I teach to you. And what I preach and teach to you, I preach and teach to me. That we have to fight the battle. We have to grow spiritually, grow in Christ, grow in the Spirit. Because then we will experience more success in this battle. And that I have seen. 
That is real. And, and we need each other to help each other. Another thing is if you have friends who are leading you into darkness, change your friends. Okay. You say, but I, I love my friends. I'm loyal to my friends. Are you going to let your friends destroy you? Are you going to let your friends ruin your life? Okay, no friend is perfect. I'm not saying that. But if your friends are continually leading you into darkness, change your friends for your own sake. Okay. How do we apply Ephesians 2.15? Jew and Gentile reconciled in Christ in Myanmar context. Well, remember what I said. Ephesians 2 is saying that the gospel now it includes the Gentile. It's inclusive of all those who put their faith in Christ. So, how do we apply that in the Myanmar context? We preach the gospel of Christ so as to include as many people who will accept the gospel. That's, that would be Paul's answer. Paul's answer would not be that we accept all other religions as equally valid. Paul would never say that. He didn't believe that. So Ephesians 2 is saying we all have hope through Christ. So preach that message. Believe it. Enjoy it. Bring others in. But don't. Don't tell them they don't need Christ. Oh, you, oh, you have Buddha. We have Christ. You have Buddha. It's okay. What? What? How could you say that based on the teaching of Scripture? I don't, I don't, think, I don't think you can. Okay. Uh, 10. Is Christ's sacrifice sufficient for reconciliation of the entire creation? Yes, it's sufficient. As far as we know, based on Paul's teaching, because, but why is it sufficient? We don't know. Because we, we don't really understand why his death on the cross brings us reconciliation. I mean, I don't know, really. But it's what the gospel is preached. It's what the message is. But I, I don't really know why that is. I don't know why God couldn't have chosen another way. But it's the way Hebrews, we'll talk about Hebrews after Christmas, but in one passage of Hebrews, he says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So, in the first century, the Jews and Christians alike believed that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But with the shedding of blood, the right blood, there is forgiveness, there is reconciliation. But after that, I can't, I can't explain more because we don't have much more explanation. That would, that would be a good topic for your paper, by the way. If you're interested in reconciliation or atonement, then, then that would be a good, a good New Testament theology topic. Uh, Ephesians 4, what does one baptism mean? There is a note in your guide about one baptism, one father. I think... I think what he meant was that in the early church, even though there were different beliefs, but as far as I can tell, for the most part, there was a common faith. There was a believer's baptism. That's why as Baptists, we use believer's baptism, adult baptism. Um, I think what he's trying to say is, is not... Well, okay, these are two negatives. That's, that's hard for non-English speakers. Let me say it differently. He acknowledges there are many different beliefs. He knows that. But he also says that in the Christian church, for the most part, there's a lot of common belief. And that includes faith in Christ, the grace of God, and how you're supposed to live. It includes that we all have to be baptized. And you're baptized in Christ. Or, and I'm not even sure about whether he'd say in the name of Christ or in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, scholars debate exactly the right formula. But the point is that we're all baptized into Christ. That's Romans chapter 6. I think that's what he means by one baptism. Because we all believe that, even though there are differences around, the, around it. 
According to Colossians, all things were created by Him. Will all things, including nature, be saved by Him? Well, they will either be saved by Him or destroyed by Him. Okay? So what we get in the Bible is the idea of the redemption of creation, Romans chapter 8. So again, what we see in Colossians, we are finding in Romans, which is another reason why I say this is Pauline thought. Yes, he says all of nature is groaning for the day of redemption. All right, so he's, that implies all of creation is waiting for the final redemption. And so the answer is yes, all will be redeemed. But other passages in Scripture talk about a new heaven and a new earth. So this might pass away, in other words, be destroyed, and something new created. Both traditions are in the New Testament. How does the Spirit of God work among other religions? I don't know. <laughs> I told you before, the one thing I know is that the Spirit of God is what gives life to everyone. In Romans chapter 2, Paul says that the Gentiles, without the law, sometimes do good things. And so I think that is the sign of God at work in their life. But don't think that's the same thing as what Paul is teaching about the Spirit-led life. It's not the same thing. That's something that some theologians do. They say, well, we believe in the Spirit, but, 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 the Spirit's are everywhere in the world. Yes, but that's not what he teaches. So please, keep going back to what he teaches, not to what you think about what he teaches. That's this course is about read the text. What does he say? And then we'll think about it. But clearly he believes that the, the Spirit was given to Christians in a way that is not the same as is in most of the world. Could the Spirit of God work in some special way? Sure. I'm sure he could. But that's not what he's teaching by and large. And if you, if you find the Spirit of God in, in someone you meet, praise God. I mean, it's not your job to judge them. Your job is to preach the gospel, to love them, to seek to live in harmony with them. That's your job. But don't change your gospel so that you can you know, get along better. I think that's, I mean, I know that's dangerous. I think he just, I think he believed that God was, Christ was coming back in his day and there was no point in trying to, to have a revolution. No, just be a good slave, be a good wife, be a good husband. Christ is coming back. Focus on being a good Christian. Don't focus on your rights and your revolution and your changing things. Now, we can discuss whether or not that's, that's best for today. But you asked me about what did Paul believe, and I think that's fair to Paul. Uh, according to Ephesians, Paul said there's no wall between Jews and Gentiles. Why are there walls among Christian denominations? Because of human nature. Humans create walls. We just do it by nature. It's not because of the gospel. It's because of our inability to focus on the right things and to be led by the Spirit. And Paul even says at one place, there have to be differences among you to discern what is God's will. So that will come. Their differences are to be expected. And I think my view at this point in my life is don't worry about it. <laughs> in other words, let the Lutherans be the Lutherans. Let the Baptists be the Baptists. Let the Pentecostals be the Pentecostals. If they're worshiping Jesus Christ, and they're trying to live a spirit-filled life, then praise God. And we're going to have little differences or big differences. Catholic Church thinks that salvation has to be through them. Okay, I have many really good Catholic friends. I love them. They're, they're followers of Christ. Uh, the Anglicans are basically Catholic, but they aren't, don't feel comfortable underneath the Catholic hierarchy. Uh, but they can have communion. Some thinks yes, some say no, but I say yes. I say we should all have communion with other Christians. As long as Christ is in the center and they want to live a spirit-filled life. Uh, that's my view. Uh, I think Paul 
I think Paul uh, would say that too. Can Christians lose their salvation, lose their faith? Okay, next time, all right? Because that goes in with what we're going to talk about next week. Difference between John, the difference between Paul and John Calvin and predestination. That's a funny one. Only because it's a good question, but John Calvin would say his view is Paul's view. So if I say there's a difference, then I'm I'm disagreeing with John Calvin. John Calvin believes his view is the same as Paul's view, and um, I think he's probably right. I think John Calvin is is I went to a Presbyterian seminary, so I I'm I, I read the Institutes. Uh, I think they're very good. But I think the reality is bigger than John Calvin understands. But John Calvin's really faithful to Scripture, so I, I can highly recommend him. Now may our wonderful God, who chose you before the creation of time, to be his sons and daughters, may he fill you up with faith and gratitude and joy and peace because of your salvation through Christ. May he give you strength to fight the spiritual battle against the forces of evil. And may he give you confidence and motivation to share this precious gospel with all those around us who need it and who could benefit from it. Amen.